haven't seen you in forever. Oh, that's terrible. So anyway, good evening. My name is Leah Herrier, and I am following the directions of our technical guru, Mr. Jonathan Spivey. Yay, Jonathan. But this evening, we want to thank each and every one of you for coming out. As you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. All of us in this room at some point in our lives have been affected with mental health, whether it's personal, whether it's a family member, an extended family member, or a friend. All of us have been affected in some shape, form, or fashion as it relates to PTSD from COVID. And that is another form of a mental health issue. This evening, we're gathered with an expert panel directly behind me, and the individuals are going to be speaking to us about mental health, things that we need to be aware of, and any and all questions that you may have, we will have a Q&A at the end. So we want to thank our esteemed panelists, Hi, panelists. Look at you between two very attractive ladies. When was the last time that happened? You've got three of them with you all at once. All right. Are you ready? You're ready. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly Hayes, one of the organizers of this evening's event. And Kimberly will take it away. Thank you, Leah. Let's give her a round of applause for that welcome. Uh, as she said, my name is Kimberly Hayes. I am with the Charlottesville, Virginia chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. And we welcome you to one of the final days of Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, we don't get to talk about it enough, so we thank you all for joining us tonight and thinking this topic is important to, enough to talk about further. So I'm going to start off with some statistics about mental health before we introduce our panel and we'll get into some questions. Does that sound good? Okay. What is mental and behavioral health? According to the CDC, mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. Mental health is very important at every stage of life from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. Behavioral health has more to do with the specific actions people take. It is about how people respond in various scenarios. Behavioral health can be influenced by an individual's mental health. I'm going to read you a few statistics specifically on suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 15 to 24 in the United States. Nearly 20% of high school students report serious thoughts of suicide, and 9% have made an attempt to take their lives, according to the National Alliance on Mental Health. In 2022, 2% of college students surveyed said they had attempted suicide in the past year. That's higher than reports from the 2007 to 2021 time period. Transgender and non-binary students report far higher rates of suicide-related thoughts and behaviors than cisgender students. An estimated seven, 703,000 people die by suicide worldwide each year. Over one in every 100 deaths, 1.3%, in 2019 was the result of suicide. The global suicide rate is over twice as high among men than women. Now, this is just some background information about what we're gonna get into tonight. I'm gonna now introduce our esteemed panel. So right here to my, my right, I have Marquita Madden. She's the programs manager for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Virginia chapter. Marquita is the programs manager for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and she became staff in July 2022 after serving as an active volunteer with the chapter for over five years. Immediately before, coming, before becoming staff, Marquita served as the board chair for the chapter and chaired the Greater Shenandoah Valley Out of the Darkness Walk. 
Marquita is a suicide loss survivor and is very passionate about the work of AFSP. When not working, she enjoys time with her family and spoiling her miniature schnauzer, Sir Bobby. Please welcome Marquita Madden. Next, we have Senator Cree Deeds. State Senator Cree Deeds has been representing Charlottesville and Albemarle County in the legislature for over 20 years. As one of the most trusted leaders in the state Senate, Cree presides as the co-chair of the Judiciary Committee and serves on the Finance and Appropriations, Commerce and Labor, Rules and Privileges and Elections Committees. Senator Deeds also serves as the chair of the Capital Outlay Subcommittee chair of the Behavioral Health Commission, and chair of the Joint Commission on Administrative Rules. Cree has dedicated his life to reforming our broken mental health system. Cree fought to establish the Behavioral Health Commission, implemented and expanded the use of mobile crisis services, and successfully advocated for historic comprehensive, comprehensive investments into our mental health system, like attracting new mental health professionals and increasing hospital beds capacity for those in need of care. His life-saving work has earned him recognition both nationally and across the Commonwealth as a foremost champion for mental health reform. Please welcome Senator Cree Deeds. And last but not least, we have Dona Edwards. Dona worked in corporate America for almost 25 years, starting as a mechanical engineer, working on space shuttle and satellite technology, and most recently as an executive practicing intellectual property law. She was responsible for driving the, globe, the global intellectual property strategy, managing litigations, and providing general legal advice. She left her successful career after a life-changing event that had many twists and curves, led her on a path to her true passions. Dona is a TEDx speaker and a thought leader sharing stories on the subjects of adaptive fashion, disability, DEI, empathy, and scoliosis. She has a mechanical engineering degree from Stanford and a JD from George Washington University Law School and an MBA from UVA Darden School of Business is also a member of the Charlottesville, Virginia chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. Please welcome Dona Edwards. So uh, to get this started, we have a number of questions that we'd like to get some input from our panelists on. And please feel free to have questions. So we're going to engage with you in a question and answer uh, session just after we get through these questions. But at any time, if I'm going too fast or someone's talking too fast, just raise your hand, nudge us, so we can make sure everybody feels heard. That sound good? All right. Okay. So the, the first question, what's the best way to approach the mental health subject with our communities? Anyone? Well, th thank you all so much for, for having me here and allow me to be part of this. I think part of the problem over the, the course of time is that we don't talk enough about mental health. We talk about physical health. We have breast cancer screenings. We have cancer screenings of all kinds. We, we have diabetes tests. We don't, we don't, we encourage people to take care of the physical well-being. We don't talk enough about mental health. There's too much stigma around it. So events like this are the beginning of the way we address mental health with our communities. But we have to go further than that. I would suggest, you know, in Virginia, mental health services come basically three ways. Um, the majority through the private sector, but partially through the public, there's a public organization in every community, a community service board. I, I would suggest that Region 10, you know, would be a good idea to reach out to Region 10 and have Region 10 hold community mental health festivals, community mental health events where where widespread education can be offered, not force fed to anybody, not forced on anyone, but if you make the information available, um, you, you allow people to begin to understand what's available. And that, that also can allow them perhaps to think about some things they've seen in their community, some things they, they've seen in themselves and, and make them better equipped to know when services would be, would be, should be available to them. 
Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on that question before we move to the next one? I would just reinforce what the senator has said. We don't talk about it enough. Um, often when I'm doing presentations in the community, the big thing that we really try to drive home is or to begin to get people to think about their mental health the same way you think about your physical health. If you walk around limping on a bad ankle for a week, eventually you're going to go see the doctor. Uh, we struggle with how we're feeling emotionally and with our mental health, and we just try to stick it out. Um, but if we begin to frame it like we do with our physical health, then after a while we're going to say, this isn't getting better. I need some help. And so I would just le lead with that to just think about our mental health the same way we think about our physical health. Great point. Is there a way to engage in a deeper dive on mental health without uh, a lot of times we get fluff in terms of mainstream and how we kind of digest mental health and it's like take your self-care days and protect your peace but that doesn't always really um, tap into the heart of the matter for people really going through mental um, crisis or illness and um, sometimes those terms can be offensive to people that really are dealing with mental health and you know as we approach the conversation more and we're hearing more about mental health you know that how do we get around the fluffiness of self-care and you know all those things that are good but we need something that taps into the heart of the matter donna you want to wait hello yes um well so this uh subject is very near and dear to my heart because i would I would say, well, part of it is that people won't talk about mental health. So we've talked about that. Um, I started going to therapy way back in 1993 when my dad passed away. I was uh, in law school. I just started law school in D.C. and uh, from Sacramento, California. And so right before I was about to leave, he got diagnosed with uh, uh terminal cancer and they gave him six months and you know my mother was like you need to hurry up and get home because he's waiting for you so when I got back to DC I just didn't know anybody there I didn't have a community and um, the law school you know suggested I do group therapy and that's how I was first um, introduced to it um, I just I needed somebody to talk to. And, you know, you get tired of talking to your friends. I was 25. Most of my friends, their parents were alive. So nobody could really relate to what I was going through. And, you know, I needed to get through law school. So, <laughs> um, so I've had a long history with uh, therapy because my feeling is everybody should be in therapy all the time, not just when there's a crisis. Um, because there's just so much you can learn about yourself, you can talk about and just be, if you find a good one and you know, definitely find one that you connect with, you can talk about anything you want to without judgment, you know? So um, I say all that to say that my, um, back to the question, the self-care, so I'm a person who, uh, I had spinal fusion surgery about five years ago, but even before that, I've always worked out four to six times a week. I go to therapy, I do meditation two to three hours a day. I, um, everything they say to do, I do that and then some. And when you're de dealing with really deep, uh, issues, those things aren't enough. I mean, and I talk to a therapist too. And so when I see those kind of uh, suggestions on what you should do, you know, I get massages all the time. I get facials all the time. I shop all the time. Um, it's just not enough. Um, it's something, it's a start. Um, but when people say that to me, I'm like, I've done that. I've done that. I've done that. And so my feeling, I mean, I don't know how you, you know, make a suggestion when people are first starting to deal with 
any kind of depression, anxiety, that kind of thing, you know, I'm like, go to the doctor. <laughs> you know, bypass, all, I mean, do that stuff. Self-care is important. But if you're dealing with some deep, you know, I mean, I had debilitating pain where I was at the point where I was laying down 20 hours a day. Uh, I had extreme exhaustion. And, you know, my parents both died early. The self-care that they suggest is not going to do anything for me but make me more depressed. So um, I don't know how you give deeper uh, suggestions other than just the, the huge thing is, you know, not seeing it as a stigma, people starting to talk about it. I mean, I talk to it, talk about therapy to anybody, all my friends, anybody asks, I have no problems with it. But I can tell you, I get a lot of resistance from people. Like, you know, when I say go, go to a therapist, I mean, I don't want to talk about pain all day. Sorry. You know, you should find a therapist to talk about these things. And I can't be your therapist. I have my own stuff going on. So I, you know, I'm like, you can go to your primary care facility, a doctor, and they can send you over. I was lucky here that because I was already at UVA getting treatment in the pain management center. They have a therapist there that um, if you can get into her, I mean, she's amazing because she deals with pain management and everything that flows from that on a daily basis. So, I mean, she's super, so compassionate and kind and just, you know, anything I want to say, I say. Um, well, I think that you uh, you said you didn't really know what to tell people, but I think you told them you, you know, unapologetically got up here and told a bunch of strangers that you've been getting therapy for years. And, you know, like you said, a lot of people are resistant to that. A lot of people are very think therapy is very taboo. So I think that's one way that we could do it is just have the conversation about it and take the stigma away from therapizing and, you know, getting mental health care. And sometimes I think it sounds a little bit more extreme than it is. But, you know, I talked to a therapist and it was just, I felt like it was just me running my mouth the whole time talking to the lady. But I mean, that is therapeutic in itself. But again, taking the stigma away from it. Um, did you want to say something, Senator Deeds? I saw you. I, I, that was a, an extremely brave way to address that question. Uh, and, and so I Thank you so much for that. You know, I grew up on a farm. When I was a kid, I, I would say to my stepfather, I, let's, let's take a vacation like those people on TV do. He, he would say, boy, those hogs have to eat while you're on vacation. <laughs> people in the country, people, farm people, worked and ate and worked some more and slept and got up the next day and did the same thing all over again. You know, you, you, you ha we all have to take time to recognize what we... When we have, when we're sick on the inside, when we have a belly ache or a headache, we take time to fix the problem. When we have a mental health issue, we have to take the time. We owe it to ourselves and the people that care about us to get get as well as we can, and that that means reach reaching out to whomever we can to try to figure out how we can get well again. Everybody's got a different path. You know that that's the problem with mental health. I want it to be like a physical physical health. I want it. I want to want us to treat it like that. But but the reality is, mental health ailments affect different people different ways. The same diagnoses might require different treat different courses of treatment for the two of us. So it's just more complicated. We still have to take the time to get well. We have to take the time to get well, and there's no easy answer. Thank you. Um, so. Dona talked about therapy and access to it. Um, less than half of the black population has received mental health services or received pres prescribed medications for mental health services from statistics taken from 2020 to 2021. How do we relay that there are accessible resources for the community? Marquita, in your work, do you see that a lot of the black population is served. Um, I know that statistically, um, 
black youth have not been the leaders in the um, dying by suicide, but those numbers are increasing. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Um, yeah, you're, you're right. Actually, black males have some of the fastest rising numbers as far as suicide rates. Uh, and ironically, I'd like to know the answer for this. Black women have the lowest rates. I don't know what the resilience factor is there for us. Um, I, I think it's just important that we continue to get into the community. You know, I didn't put it out, but I have some information over there about a, um, a workshop that I can deliver called uh, Soul, Shop, uh, Soul Shop for the Black Church. And it's really just about talking to the Black Church about mental health and be, getting comfortable having that conversation, getting comfortable even saying the word suicide because we don't even want to say it sometimes. Um, and it's just, and, and my background is communication. So one thing that I've learned is sometimes the message has to be, it's the same message, but it's got to be delivered different ways so that people can receive it in the way that's most comfortable to them. Um, so sometimes we've just got to bring it, bring the message to the people where they're at. Um, in the faith community, which obviously is a large part of our community, we've been told for so long, just pray about it. Um, as a person of faith, my response to that, I was thinking about this today, is faith without works is dead. We've got to put something along with that. We've got to, you know, practice, find that self-care. We've got to be proactive about how we're caring for ourselves. It's okay. It's not a selfish thing to take care of ourselves. And taking care of ourselves, again, includes taking care of our mental health. And, you know, something you said made me know, you know, language is very important. And, you know, talking about mental health, talking about suicide, um, you know, there are things that we learn every day. Like I learned a couple of years ago that it is not appropriate to say committed suicide. You are supposed to say died by suicide because there is a stigma attached to suicide and using the word committed is... Um, I think, I, I don't know the technical explanation. It's judgmental. You're making a judgment about the way a person dies. You know, to, to say commit in, implies an intentional act. Exactly. Infers an intentional act. Well, you don't know what that person's state of mind was at the time they died. You don't know what caused them, took them down that path. And so to say committed suicide is, is judgmental. I understand that some people will disagree, but that's, that's the way I, I read it. Thank you for um, jumping in there because, again, that is important. And we can take small steps just like that, just by changing language, removing the stigma to, to help move the conversation along, especially in our communities where topics like that have been taboo. So I think that those small things can lead to a big change. And, you know, how do we get, and specifically the Black community, to get past the stigma of therapy and managing depression or depressive episodes that could lead to suicide. Marquita, do you want to talk any more about that in your work? Because you probably see this. I'm sorry, say it one more time. About. So, so, so as Senator Deeds, as Senator Deeds said, when you say someone committed suicide, that is placing a judgment on them that you do not know. By saying committed, it lends to the thought that they were intentional and they said, I'm going to do this. Sometimes they may not know that they are going to end their life. So you'll probably pay more attention to this now because we're talking about it now. But when you see reporting on people who die by suicide, you will hear news reporters say they died by suicide. I mean, very it's very infrequent that I hear reporters or responsible journalists say committed suicide because, and, and this has been some time that I've known this, but a lot of people, if this is not your wheelhouse or your space to be in, you don't know anyone affected, then you may not know it. But now the onus is on all of us because you are, no, you are, uh, you know this now because you're hearing this today. So it's the onus is on you to educate people around you to say, don't say committed. Like if you hear someone, do you know this person committed suicide? No, say they died by suicide. I do it. And sometimes they kind of ignore me, but they've heard it. 
and we have to put the onus on ourselves to continue to educate people. I mean, this is like any language throughout American history. It's only going to uh, get to this place if we take, you know, the responsibility to share it with others. Say, uh, don't, don't use that language. You got to say this. We got to be respectful. So does that make more sense? And if it and if it helps, we don't say that somebody committed a heart attack or that they committed cancer. And so we consider that a person may have had a mental health condition at play, too. So we wouldn't we don't say they committed. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, can we talk about some of the factors that contribute to mental health crisis? Uh, research shows that poverty level can affect serious psychological health as well as peer pressure. Um, what can be done to curb these factors to lessen the amount of those who suffer with symptoms of depression? Does it start in school? Does it start in churches, in our communities? Like, how do we address this? Anybody want to tackle that? Okay, so I'm not a professional, so I'm going to say that from the beginning. Um, how, how does it start? Who does it affect? I, I, I am concerned with using that kind of language because I think that whether you're getting bullied on social media in junior high school or you're 55 years old, you can have different reasons for feeling these kind of feelings. Um, somebody who is working really hard, has money, stressed, they could have feelings of depression. I mean, you hear that all the time. Somebody who you who looks happy, um, the person I'm thinking about is uh, Stretch, does his name Stretch, who used to be on uh, um, Ellen's show? Twitch. Twitch. The DJ. He used to be Ellen's DJ um, on the Ellen show. I mean, I watch Ellen's show all the time because I'm at home and he looked happy. He was showing videos with him and his wife doing dance um, routines. Um, he joking, had young kids. Young kids. And the show ended and all of a sudden he committed suicide. Died by suicide. I mean, sorry. <laughs> Died by suicide. <laughs> No, no, we just, it's, it's died by suicide. We just, you, you came in late when we already went over that. And the, we talk about the judgment that is placed on, hold on, ma'am. We, we talk about the judgment that is placed on the deceased by saying they committed an act. So the, so the, uh, allow me to finish, allow me to finish. So uh, allow me to finish, honey. The, we say died by suicide. That is the correct term. So we don't want to place judgment on the departed by saying they committed an intentional act. So we... we but you are implying by saying, die, well, die by suicide has been judgment. You are implying that it is actually a morally wrong thing to recommend suicide. Because that's what it's not. No, ma'am. I think it's the opposite. But when you, when you place judgment and say someone committed something, that is where the judgment comes in. But we're, we're going to move beyond that, and we've already... As a, as a group and following research, determine that the correct language when talking about victims of suicide is that they died by suicide because that is how they died. Okay, so we're going to continue and talk about the um, research to show that males suffer greater risk for suicide than that of their female counterparts, which Marquita touched on a little bit. And I want to know, is there something is there something that we may be missing that could bridge the gap between young men or males that can lessen these statistics to gear them away from things that may lead to depressive episodes or suicide versus female counterparts? You know, young guys want have this macho image that they think they need to live up to all the time. And they, they, young guys sometimes are the last people that will reach out for help. And so it really, it, it's all of our responsibility to change the way we talk and change the way we converse about these sorts of matters so we can have inclusive conversations that include everybody and, and can, can teach young guys that it's all right to feel. It's all right to cry. It's all right to be upset. 
-hmm. and it's all right to ask for help. You know, that, that, that's a real problem. I, I heard something last year on NPR, I don't know if this is correct, still correct, that, that there, there was a rise, a slight rise in the a number of young women mm -hmm. who were dying by suicide. Is that, is that so? I think that's correct. So what what have you seen in your research, Marquita, about approaching or addressing the male youth that deal with these episodes outside of maybe any resistance that they may have? Well, stigma is definitely, the, I think, the greatest barrier um, because if we can get past the stigma, then people will seek help. Um, but I think what we also have to understand about people who die by suicide is research has shown us that it's not one factor. There's not one reason that leads them to take their own lives. That usually there's an intersection of a variety of factors. It can be, did they have a family history? Um, you know, environmentally, do they have access to means? That's something that's really concerning. Uh, if you're, you know, we're talking about being in rural areas where people maybe don't have access to care as readily as some of us do. Um, and now you've got someone who's dealing with depression and they have access to means. Um, you know, are there things like, um, you know, a family history? Uh, like I said, a family history, do they have substance use issues at play? What are the things that are going on? Is there bullying at play? All of these things kind of intersect to create that storm uh, that becomes that crisis, that becomes that moment where thinking becomes so limited um, that, you know, we can only see, a person can only see that one way out. Um, so we have to consider, I think, the big picture and not just the fact that, yeah, poverty can play a role in can they get access to, to the care, but what else is at play? Because maybe we can't pull them out of poverty right away, but can we make sure that there's access to care in their communities? Can we make sure that, uh, you know, they're addressing if there's a historical factor, that we're just talking about it so that they're comfortable talking about it um, and that we're making sure the environment they're in then is safe for them to be in. In your work, have you seen um, this demographic gravitate to any of the resources? I I'm going to say that, um, and, and not because of any specific research, but just because of general things that I've heard, particularly coming through COVID. I think COVID pushed a lot of people to the wall and they said, I give, I gotta have some help. And we saw the numbers to the crisis lines. Uh, people were more uh, willing to call and, and ask for help. The challenge now has been on the other side of that because when they reach out for help, we don't have the resources to direct them to. So now, you know, now we've tipped the cart the other way. Um, but at least if we can, again, keep these conversations going, like the one that you're having here tonight, uh, because kind of going back to talking about that self-care, it's different. Yeah, it's different for everybody. Some people may need therapy. Some people may need therapy, therapy plus medicine. Some people might just need to have somebody that they can talk to once a week, uh, you know, a friend that they just sit down and have coffee with and let some things off their chest. Um, I'll share a story real quick. I don't want to talk too much, but my sister is a social worker. And for a time period after 988 launched the new crisis line, um, she was working that just to kind of fill some gaps there at the beginning. And she said oftentimes people would call and they would just spill. She never said a word. At the end of the conversation, they would say, thank you. You've helped me so much. I feel so much better. So sometimes people just need that opportunity to talk. And for those of you that don't know, uh, the 988 hotline is just like 911, but for people dealing with mental health crisis. So that is a resource that we can share and we want people to use. Did you want to say something? Um, I really talk about And whatnot, and I want to know about the if there are other factors. Can we pick back up? I heard poverty, mm -hmm. and then we kind of went and talked a little bit. Did you have other factors specifically so, you want to address? Yes. Yeah, so I did in in preparation for this event. I did some research on some websites, the CDC, um, other um, 
websites that were targeted towards the black community and mental health. And I can share those with you um, I, just because, you know, the audience is not just, you know, African-American folks. I didn't want to just dominate with that. But this is for our community, too. But there are others that I can share. But specifically for African-Americans, it was poverty and lack of resources and um, peer pressure and like for those that are transgender or non-binary, a lot of bullying. And as you can see, if you are um, a minor and you're dealing with those issues and you live in a state where everything is, nothing is done to reaffirm who you are. It's all done to say you're not normal uh, as what people call, just a moment, is what people call like othering, making you feel like you're not normal or something is wrong with you when you can't help how you feel. Like, this is how I feel. It doesn't feel normal. Oh, I've identified something that says this is maybe what I'm dealing with. But if you have all of these powers that be that are trying to pass laws to say you are forever othered and you can't be who you feel like you're going to be, that definitely contributes to people that, based on these statistics, um, people that want to take their lives. Can I add something? Oh. From a more general perspective, there are three categories of risk factors. There's environmental, so those things like access to lethal beans, other things that are taking place in your environment, that bullying. There's historical, the family history, um, trauma, abuse, those kind of things. And then there's health. Is there a history of mental health conditions? Often people too with chronic health conditions are at risk um, because you know they're dealing with chronic pain. So those things fall into that health category. So environmental, uh, historical, and health factors. Thank you. All of those are symptoms, but they could be mitigated if you have strong community. So many, like, so many notices in your state. Right. Uh, that that um, goes in conjunction with what she was saying about the resources and COVID and how now people are gravitating towards those, but now we don't have as many as much access to resources. Yeah, Thank you. This is probably um, encapsulated in a few different categories you described. I think when you speak about African Americans and males in particular, the issue turns out often about help, hopelessness. It's just not being able to see a life beyond the life they're in, um, shortens a person's eyesight or their vision about who they can become. And so therefore, I mean, that's, that becomes quite depressing, uh, especially when it's reinforced each and every day as they try to live their lives. So I think that's a, I don't know if it's a category, but it certainly does um, play a part. Thank you. And I think that that goes into um, what we hear a lot about representation. Like if you can see yourself in someone else, you feel like, oh, I can, you know, uh, uh, I can strive for that. I can be that. If I see someone who I feel like I can identify with, that's why you hear a lot of people say representation matters. If you see people that look like you in school as your teacher on screen in film, you know, in these places. And I think that having that positive reinforcement is huge. And I think that that, that really goes into, um, you know, my next point where we talked about, I talked about, I mentioned school um, for youth dealing with um, depression or thoughts of suicide. And, you know, something came up and I don't know if anybody uh, can weigh in on this, but how do we ensure that we have trained counselors in school to be able to deal with some, you know, mental health crisis due to behavioral disruptions in school where, you know, we're aware of the school to prison, uh, school to prison pipeline where a student may be acting out due to behavioral issues or mental crisis, but it may not be because of lack of counselors or resources who are specialists in that space. They, the, the child could get sent through a path of um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, where they could be punished instead of being treated for symptoms that are beyond their control. And how, what can be done to make sure that 
these children who don't really have much control over getting access to care um, is present. So they don't get stuck in the school to prison pipeline due to, you know, really severe behavioral issues due to mental health issue. These issues are all so complex. We've got to start by building an economy that works for everybody so that people do see hope. I, I, I'm struck out I, I, as a public hearing in, in Norfolk in probably the mid 90s. And this this 15 year old kid was he's been arrested for a gun, gun related offense down there. And he said, yeah, I, I, I did that robbery and I'll do it again. You know, my brother died when he was 17. My mother is in prison. My father is who knows where. People need hope. And it starts by building an economy that works for everybody. You know, you talk about how people get, get counseling. That, that's a huge problem. You know, we had to shut down five of our mental health hospitals, psychiatric hospitals in 2021 because we didn't have the staff to fill the and, and doing that work found, and doing that the census, we found out we were paying people at the 10th percentile nationwide. That meant that means 90 percent of the people doing that very difficult work around the country were making more than the people in Virginia's hospitals were making. So we had to bump up the pay. We didn't we, didn't, we only bumped it up to the 50th percentile, but we bumped up the pay that now we have a 28 percent vacancy rate among employees at our CSPs statewide, 28 percent. So in the budget this year, I try to bump up the pay for the employees to try to get more people into that work. But the, the main work is done in the private sector. Our, our reimbursement rates for Medicaid are so low that there aren't too many people doing that work in the private sector. That means that people that are poor, people that are on Medicaid, don't have access to behavioral health work. So we have a bump up in the budget this year. We have, if we can ever get the budget passed, we have a bump up for that. Well, your talk, point about school counselors is very real because, you know, oh, just over the last 10 years, we've started to move the ball a little bit, not enough yet, but we've moved the ball a little bit to make counselors not test graders and paper shufflers, but uh, guidance counselors, but actually put some counselors in the schools. We aren't there yet. And we aren't there yet because a, a big chunk of school funding comes from localities. You all heard of that that phrase that politicians get all the time about unfunded mandates. Well, if the state is going to require more counselors in the schools, we have to come up with the state funding for it. We have to step up. That that's up to the localities too. They're they're police officers in some schools. They have resource officers, and others they don't. But the issue too is that. Even if they're there, are they trained to deal with a crisis? I mean, this is similar to law enforcement when they arrive at a, you know, a distress call. Do they are they equipped to deal with someone who is not, you know, who is having a mental health crisis versus being a offender? So I think it's similar to that. It's the training. How do we get there? Yeah. And right now, I know there are a few questions. I'm about to do this like 1990s Oprah style. I'll come out so <laughs> Mrs. Bobby doesn't have to do it. So this young lady. This one. Yeah, I just want to speak to that uh, for Charlottesville, uh, along with, I guess, Mr. Bryant and I are both on the school board. And um, we're really lucky here because uh, the city of Charlottesville did fund uh, many extra mental health support people. We have, uh, we have um, school social workers in just about every school now. We have several at the high school, at the middle school, the places that need it most. Uh, we did uh, change our model of using school resource officers, so we do not have them in the building. And uh, we've, you know, I think we're lucky, and not everybody is as lucky as, as Charlottesville. The city council and the city manager agreed to fund these positions, and that's why we're able to do this. So can you talk about talk a little bit more about what that looks like, even though they're positioned there? Is there any statistics that show, okay, so we have these people there, but we had, you know, 25 students come to the counselors and they were able to stop this many, you know, depressive episodes? Or, like, yeah. do you have anything to show us, like, how that breaks down? I wish that, that we had exactly what you're saying. And it seems like it's really hard to get that granular level of data. 
what I can say, and maybe Mr. Bryan can also add to this, um, you know, <laughs> we've had uh, the, the mental health people in the schools are very, very, very busy. Um, and I do know that they, um, you know, they have offset a number of, um, you know, bigger issues that could have happened with students, um, you know, but they're, they're quite busy, uh, you know, handling issues of students that either come to them on their own volition or are sent to them, um, you know, to be seen because they're acting out. Um, we, what we don't have so much uh, are services, we used to have this like an in-school, um, <laughs> It's sort of like an in-school facility, self-contained for kids who can't handle being in the general school environment. We want to keep them in school, but we have a separate space for them with, you know, a small number of kids and, uh, you know, a couple of, you know, adults, a teacher, a counselor. That is um, actually the, the state actually did pull funding for those programs a few years ago. So we're struggling at that point. Uh, the other issue that probably I don't have to really say this to this group, but it's been a really hard year in terms of community violence. And these issues definitely come into the schools. These kids live in these neighborhoods where, um, you know, they're witnessing shootings, they're hearing shootings, they, you know, they're seeing things happen. They're really traumatized by the time they actually come in the door in school. So um, it's whoever was saying it takes a whole community, it really, really does. So we have to deal with this on many different levels. And, and like the gentleman over here said, with those statistics is a lot of hopelessness. If you're living in a community where all you're seeing is gun violence and, you know, non-gun violence, but just violence, and that trauma can really tap into that. And have a question of, over here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Just sort of add what Dr. Kraft had said. Um, as a former high school counselor, we didn't have that, that model that we have now, and it is so wonderful that we have those mental health counselors working in concert with our school counselors. Because uh, I think when um, Ms. Witt said she was um, a school psychologist, a lot of school psychologists, a lot of that work. And so now we have this model that those uh, mental health counselors are working in conjunction. Um, I attended a workshop last year at VSBA, and one of the things, it was a mental health workshop, and one of the things that stood out to me most with that young lady, she said, there are two things that students are going to do. They're going to either unpack what's going on in their lives at the door, or they're going to bring those issues into the schoolhouse with them. So... Being, having said that, I think that our counselors are doing a great job. We are so, and we are grateful to have that model because it gives an opportunity for those mental health folks to reach out into the community, to get the parents more involved because there's a lot of trauma with our students. And certainly COVID did not help that. So it's gonna take us a long time to rebound in terms of the academic performance of our students. I think people just want instant gratification, but they forget that not only are the students traumatized, also the parents of our students as well. So they have lots of trauma that they are dealing with. Thank you. You have a question here? Um, hi, I'm one of the physicians that practices at UVA Teen Health. So mental health is impacts me every day in my clinical practice. And one of the big things is the lack of parity with Medicaid. And so I have a patient and they have Medicaid and what am I going to do, particularly our patients with eating disorders, and it's actually an inequality of care. I have patients who need higher levels of care, and we can't send them because these programs do not take Medicaid, and we've run into challenges with that. What can be done to improve parity with, with Medicaid? Because, you know, a lot of programs will say Medicaid pays like crap, so we're not going to take these patients. You know, not non... Um, non-mental health answer to begin with. We worked for many years to, to, to build a dental benefit for adults in Medicaid, our Medicaid program. Other states did it. We did. Finally, we got it passed in 2021. 2021, the Finance Committee is meeting in Abington, Virginia, in the far southwest part of the state. And a dentist is, is testifying, extolling the virtues of 
of Medicaid dental, the dental, dental benefit. And so I asked the question, how has this affected your practice? He said, oh, no, I can't afford to take Medicaid. We had to go. We did that in 2021 and 2022. We went back and raised the benefit. We had to. In this year's budget, and part of our negotiations, which are ongoing, is a, an, an increase in the behavioral health, the specific benefit for the Medicaid recipients. Because even though we, we see we seem to invest an awful lot of money in um, the community service boards and the, the psychiatric hospitals, the vast majority of people that receive care receive it in the private sector. And so if we don't, if I, we understand that if we don't increase the, the Medicaid benefit, the Medicaid reimbursement rate, we are effectively denying those people coverage. And that's why it has to be done. And that, that that's one of the hangups. We, we've got a, a billion dollar hang up right now between the House and the Senate. Part of what we're trying to do is, is invest $214 million in, in mental health services. And that's part of it. I'll be glad to talk about it some other time. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the panel for being here um, and discussing these issues. They're so important. As a softball mom and sometimes a teen mom of young girls ages 12 to 17, they confide in me. So this goes back to the trained versus untrained. How do you address a situation that a young girl brings to you where she may be punished for um, something that she wants to tell you? If, for example, um, if you see that she's cutting herself or that she does have thoughts of suicide, how do you approach that in the best way possible? You know, I, I don't know what the perfect answer is for everybody. I can tell you that when my son said that he was he was thinking about committing thinking about killing himself, I I went to the I I, I hauled his rear end to the magistrate and had him committed. I did what I had to do to save his life. I, I tried that three times. It didn't work in the, in the end. But you know you do whatever you have to do to protect your children. You get in their face and and um you get in their face. You get in their business. You do what you have to do. Marquita, do you deal with that with um, your demographic? With the, I'm going to agree with that wholeheartedly, not just in my role, but as a parent. Um, a, a little bit about me. Um, I have lost three close family members to suicide. I lost a brother in 2006. I lost my father in 2016. And I lost another brother exactly eight months later in 2017. So I'm at the point of be bold. Do what you have to do. And when young people come to me with things, the thing you have to kind of start with is, I can't promise you that I'm going to keep this a secret. I can only promise you that I'm going to not betray your confidence um, and tell any more people than I need to. I'm going to tell the people that I need to tell to keep you safe. But this is not just about putting you on blast. This is just about keeping you safe. Um, I also have a 17-year-old son who I adopted as an infant who struggles really with depression and anxiety. And so even going back to the other question, as parents, advocate, advocate, advocate. Uh, I stay in people's faces for what my son needs, even within the school. And I, I tell the teachers and the administration, I'm sorry uh, but, you know, I'm out here doing this work for everybody else. And I believe if I can't do it in my community first, then I just need to sit down. And my community starts with my household. So I'm sorry that you've got 2,000 students that are having this issue. I have one student and I'm his biggest advocate. And that's who I'm here for. So if the other parents don't show up, I don't have any control over that. But I'm showing up for this one and we're going to get him what he needs. <clears throat> and we are mandated reporters. If we hear that a child is getting ready to hurt themselves or some type of abuse, we are to call CPS. That's, that's your first place that you call, correct? I don't, I don't, I don't think it's CPS. No, not not in that instance. Um, I mean, obviously, you need to call parents, but if they're in imminent danger at school, then you need to call nine one one. Yeah. S 
so, you know, I, I see this also from a, a different standpoint from um, uh, being in, in the legal profession. And you talk about the um, uh, school to prison pipeline. Um, there was a period of time where in one of the outlying counties, uh, they were having discipline issues. And the way that it was addressed is, is if the child turned 18, they were brought into court and charged with disorderly conduct, which is a misdemeanor. Uh, that quickly got shut down because it was, but I, my concern is, is okay, there is a mechanism through the court system where what we call chins petitions can be filed. It's child in need of services or um, uh, if it has to do with attendance, then it's with truancy. But it goes back to what you're saying about the funding and, and the access. Because we know with regards to like Medicaid, what you're saying about Medicaid, but there's also the middle class that is getting squeezed out. Their insurance is only going to pay for so many sessions. And then, you know, what avenues are there for them? Same thing you're talking about CSB and the vacancy rate. We can, you know, here in Charlottesville, Avamar, we do have, you know, good outreach. You know, there's a FAP team that they can send the case to and they come up with recommendations. They'll say go to counseling. I've had cases where we've had a, a child to go through two or three different counselors trying to find somebody. And we're talking about six months down the road before the child gets the help. And and so that is a frustrating point. So I I, I like the idea of you know trying to get the funding there, but it is like you're saying with the with the dentist, I can't afford to do this because it's not going to help me. Anybody? I you're right. I'm I'm in I'm in a fortunate position because uh, my 17 year old. We've been trying to find a counselor that that matches him and his needs. And so, I was actually at an event, a similar event to this in Petersburg a couple weeks ago, and met a counselor. And I'm driving to Richmond tomorrow to take my kid to meet this counselor because I can I can do that. Um, but what I learned through the process is sometimes I have to keep calling. Um, and again, it, the, the onus falls on parents um, but because sometimes we're seeing, you know, we look online at everything and we see, oh, they're not accepting new clients, but still call them anyway, because this is a revolving door and you never know. Um, and I have had in other instances, service providers that said, you know, I was a foster parent for many years. So I had service providers that I was told were not taking new Medicaid patients, but I'd call and make an appeal and they would, take, they would make an exception at times. So sometimes you just have to kind of push the button a little bit um, to do what you have to do, at least to get us through here uh, until we can get these other things implemented. I would say, you know, keep, don't give up. Whatever you do, don't give up. Do we have more questions? Yes, sir. I hope it's a good question. Um, is there a basic course? I don't know, because I know you guys are professional, but is there a basic course that we can take as church members or, um, that can help, that we can recognize people that has a illness as well as ourselves? Is there a basic course that can help someone or we can get started in? Yeah, uh, the senator said mental health first aid. Um, AFSP offers something called Talk Saves Lives. It can be done as a lunch and learn. It's 45 minutes to an hour long. It covers the basics. It's, it's similar to mental health first aid. I don't actually teach that one, so I can't speak to the specifics. But Talk Saves Lives um, covers uh, risk factors, warning signs, protective factors, because like this young lady mentioned, we also have protective factors. That community is one of those protective factors. Um, and then uh, it covers some research. Um, and then what can we do? What does that conversation look like when you've got someone you think is approaching a crisis? How do you talk to them about it? 
that's not going to take you through how to actually do an intervention per se, uh, but it's going to get you comfortable with having that initial conversation. And there are some other courses that go a little further, but those are some introductory type courses. And the mental health first aid course is, a little, is an expanded version of that that ought to be available through Region 10. It's a, like a six to eight hour course. So you, you got to plan for a full full day on a Saturday or something to take it, but you that that's worth taking. And I might add, I'm not a professional, but just humanity. Because sometimes I know when you said specifically for the black church, you know, so I've you know been raised in church and been around people and kids will say, I'm depressed. And the parent will say, oh, you're not depressed when they may be going through it. So maybe just some humanity when, you know, a young person or someone is coming to you and you may not know how to deal with it, but just, you know, don't make them feel like they don't have anybody. They want to be seen and heard and things like that. And I mean, I think it's important that you ask that question that shows you want to help. And we need more of that in our community so, you know, our kids can feel like they are protected and they have somewhere to go and people that care about them and concerned. So I'm schizophrenic and um, uh, every, like I, my father was schizophrenic, his father was schizophrenic. We're, um, and there's, there's a huge issue with, I mean, I've been through the mental health system in Charlottesville. And um, when, you're, when you're trying to get help, it's almost impossible because, one, the criteria for getting into the mental institution is you're, you, you have to be at the point where you're hurting yourself or others. If you're at that point, you're too far gone for help. Like, like, the, like I don't know if this is a legal thing or, like, or if this is a hospital thing, but that like a lot of other state, states have the criteria for getting in is you just need help. And um, so also um, whenever, like most, most people who are mentally ill their first introduction into the world is they're thrown in the back of a police car and they're taken to jail. Like that is our mental health care system. And that's horrifying. Um, so every step of the way, it, also, yeah, if you're, if somebody comes to you telling you they're having an issue, like they need love, like really that's, that's what it is. Um, they're, they're reaching out for help. Just love them. Like um, uh, also there's a, program called peer support counseling. They have one that's, it's specifically for mentally ill people who are helping mentally ill people, but the people who run those, they also run uh, like support counseling, like, you know, community support counseling. So and thank one, you for sharing that. One of those facilities is on your own just yeah. down the street. Yeah. Char Charles, so they do a great job there. Um, th there are certain models of, of the, the intersection of criminal justice and mental health is pretty severe. There are certain models around the country where People do a much better job of dealing with people in those situations than we do, for example. I would, I would suggest that you look at San Antonio, Texas, or Dade County, Florida, as two examples of, of, of places that have done a, a really good job, a remarkable job of diverting people with mental illness from the criminal justice system and have saved money in the long haul. They save money in the cost of correction in the long haul. I also want to tell you that, that this 988 um, crisis no number is going to be printed on student IDs, K through 12, and higher education as of this fall. So the number, will, people will have access to, to help if they need it. Great. Do you have another question? Yeah, just a couple of other things I wanted to say. And, and I, full disclosure, I'm a clinical psychologist, now retired, but I've spent my career as a therapist. Um, and uh, first I wanted to mention that we now locally have a mental health court. Um, and no, it's a good thing. Be well, okay. Uh, what it does is people who end up, you know, in court and also have a lot of other uh, you know, mental health issues, uh, it's an opportunity for a team to come together and deal with those, um, you know, from a mental health perspective and help the person connect with uh, the right help and then follow up with that person. So I, I do think it's a, it's a positive step there. Um, and I guess I, I want to say this, that uh, I mean, I could say so many things. I'm so glad you ha you're having this session. Um, 
you know, I spent a lot of years uh, in private practice right here in Charlottesville. And what I would say, there's so many, so many practitioners here. I mean, this community is rich with private practitioners, but there's no pressure put on them to, you know, sort of give back to the community in a way by saying, okay, I am, I'm going to be, I'm going to take X number of Medicaid clients, or I'm going to take some pro bono clients, or I'm going to offer a sliding scale um, for some of my clients. Everybody has to make a living, but I do feel like, um, you know, I, f I felt that way in practice, and I did some of those things myself, but I really think that more pressure could be put on this private practice community through, um, I guess Reverend Ed Edwards isn't here, but somebody like him or, you know, from the faith community could say, come on, you know, do your part here. You know, we have a lot of needs. We have a, a huge number of providers, but there's a mismatch. There's a gap there. And um, I would love to see uh, the community put more pressure and shine a light on this issue. I would love some suggestions for ways to put pressure on the professionals in the private sector. What, what can we do at the state level? Withhold your license? Put, put conditions on your license to... That might be an idea. So I'm going to be the disruptor. <laughs> I I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. However, I think it goes so much deeper than that because. Well, first of all, you're starting with a black community. I'm going to talk about the black community or just community in general who may not even want to go to a specialist. But I mean, then you have to, I mean, I don't know how many black therapists are here. I would, I mean, what I've seen is less than five and My point is, is, is that there, first you have to get somebody to go to a therapist and they're probably gonna wanna go to somebody that looks like them. In Charlottesville, at least what I've seen since 2014, there aren't many. And so I hear what you're saying that, yeah, it would be great if people would do a sliding scale and all that, but you have to get the, uh, trust. I mean, and every therapist, I mean, I feel like we're going off on a whole, I mean, this is all important. Don't get me wrong. But if you're going to talk about the community and how do we get the conversation started in the community, percentages and dollar amounts and all that is great. I mean, we need the money, but I think you got to talk about just the basics. I mean, how do we even get, whether it's a student or an adult or an older person, how do you even get them to want to talk to somebody about it, first of all? Like you said, the, the counselors are overworked. I'd like to know, is it the students coming to the counselors? Are the counselors going out to seek the students? I mean, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. But I mean, just, you know, I, I don't know. I just... There was something the other week I thought was really creative um, at another event. Optima Health was there and they've hired their first peer support specialist to help them with the mental health caseload. And they do things like call people to remind them of their appointments, check in on them randomly between appointments, particularly if they have a long gap between appointments or between getting that first appointment maybe to just say, how are you doing now that that service provider, that provider may not look like them, but chances are that peer support specialist does. And that's great if they have an appointment. I'm talking about how do you get the person who's sitting there in the house by themselves isolated, nobody to talk to, lonely. Can I ask a question? And I agree with you, um, but I'm going to take a little different turn. 
and as I do with the craft, a couple of years ago, we did a project here, and one of our big parts was on mental health. We were shooting a movie, and we were trying to get black therapists to partner with us just so we could get that information to the community. And we got absolutely zero response from black therapists in Charlottesville. Zero. I, I got Richmond, Mechanicsville, a few other places, but zero responded to us. From, so, and, and the fact that there were, at that time, nine people on staff at UVA was really disconcerting. So I think for part of that, for both of us as, as the community, those of us who are in those professions have to be have some response to that. I, I like what um, Senator D says about how do we make them put pressure. You know, we require teachers to do certain things. We require people. I think there has to be a requirement that you've got to give some community time here too. But to have no, to give the fact that we were doing a whole segment on just mental health and particularly mental health in the black community, but mental health, black community in the black church, and we could get zero response from people at UVA. Said, said something about sometimes some of us have been the enemy as well. And that's why I'm so glad these two ladies are here that really are giving us some better hope that there is hope out there for it. Because we have a lot of folks who are really hurting. Okay, Kids are hurting. Parents are hurting. Teachers are hurting. Preachers are hurting. We got statistics of how many, how many people in clergy are jumping out of windows, leaving churches, and doing things. It's not, it's, not, it's not just based on poverty. That's a major piece of it. We do know that. You know, um, but I think there is a kind of point that those of us who have, have gotten to those professional levels do have a responsibility to come back to the community. And I wanted to add one thing about the statistics. The statistics that we get are what are recorded. There are masses of people that don't report, just like with any other thing, like with rape or with incest. A lot of those people aren't reporting. So when you say, oh, this this university only has 9% reported incidents of this, but if you got all these people not even reporting, you know, you have to keep that into consideration. And I think that just looking around this room right here is promising, it's hopeful. Everybody knew what the topic was and they showed up to talk about it, to learn something and hopefully you've learned something so far. I mean, even if it's something small, just to share in your community, but you know, just being more receptive. Like I think by you being here, you're being receptive to the topic, to someone in your life that may be going through crisis or recognizing signs that are nonverbal. You know, like Dona says, someone that is isolated that you don't know. I mean, we live our lives and are all in our busy spaces. We all have stuff to do, but we have to take that extra moment to be human and think about someone else that we know that may not have, you know, the same mobility that we have, that may not have the same access to resources and just reach out. I think if COVID taught us anything about isolation and loneliness and things like that, I mean, and just quality of life, all very important. Yes, ma'am. Can you give her a mic? Mental health outreach and stuff is nobody knows what the symptoms of like mental what mental health is and what the symptoms of bad mental health is. So they don't know when to reach out. They don't know that like isolation or like, or like just right before somebody commits suicide, they get really happy. Or, you know, like people don't know this stuff. They don't understand. I like, so, and also, um, so mental illness, severe mental illness, which is like severe bipolar schizophrenia, um, uh, that affects 10% of every, every, like every race, every, uh, uh, it's like 10% of humanity across the board. Um, and like, um, but 50% of Americans will be on an antidepressant at some point in their lifetimes. Like, so, and I, I'm sure it would be higher if people actually knew that there was like options other than just being miserable. But um, so if there's like, it's, it's kind of also, it's the last place where like, we, we don't, we don't talk about it. We don't, Oh, you're like, you'll be fine. Just pick yourself up by your bootstraps or whatever, which is, um, but so like, I think like just also, can you guys have like mentally ill people in your, like when you're planning, like how to help mentally ill people have mentally ill people in the room? Cause like, we know a lot better what we need than you do. Like, 
Yes, but I will say that there is an apprehension about mental health. Yeah, there is I a mean, lot, people there's a that, huge difference between someone in crisis and someone in No, I, that's that's true. That's correct. But if I didn't know you before today to call you and say, "Hey, do you want to be on our panel?" Yeah, but there, like, there are there are so many peer support counselors. Right. There 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 are sure. there are lots of groups. I like, I understand. That is that is definitely a consideration. We would have loved to have someone <laughs> with that be on our panel. So, you thank know, you. And about 2016, we had, we put a bill through the the uh, General Assembly to, to incorporate some mental health awareness, some, some, some information about the symptoms and eighth and ninth grade health curriculum. You know, when I think about my high school years, my health classes were the, the most wasted time I had. Well, let's start using that, that health class to really teach something. And so we, we, we start started to incorporate that into eighth and ninth grade. And Jennifer McClellan, who served with me in the Senate for a long time, had a bill to build that build mental health awareness in a more of longstanding K through 12, figure out how to, to introduce some topics all the way through the process. But that, that mental health first aid class I was talking about is one sure way you'll find what to die, what, what to look for or what, what you're, what you're observing that, that will give you. Coming on. And if you take action right then, it does. You can stop it. So like, and prevent it. And people don't know that. I didn't know that. I would have loved to have known that. But like, that needs to be known. But here, here's the problem. You know, parents don't really control kids once they're 18. You, yeah, you, you like, can't. You can't. No, I know. I get that. But like, it's, it's love. It's not, you're not, yeah. not controlling. Uh, you never control somebody who love them and you give them support. Support comes from underneath. I. I, I I get it. Sometimes it's not enough. Oh, no. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But it isn't. Like, it's possible. I, I, like, people should know that it's preventable sometimes. It is preventable sometimes. Yeah. Thank you for that. And we'll make sure to get your contact information. So when we do this again next year for Mental Health Awareness Month, we can have that perspective. Um, do we have any more questions? Yes, sir. It may be uh, more of a but more of a comment than a question. First, let me give a little bit. Um, I worked at Region 10 Community Service Board for 31 years. I was not a therapist. I worked in administration. But through osmosis, you get to learn a lot <laughs> by seeing some things that go on. But what I was thinking, um, the young lady who spoke just a moment ago, she was talking about just love them. You know, they, don't discount that. Um, so much what happens with kids and even with older people is they feel disconnected because they don't think anyone loves them. And if you can just love on them, but well, one thing for sure, you won't make them get any worse by loving on them, that's for sure, okay? If there's not a heal all, we had a magic pill, and there'll be no problems in any of any sort. But I do think that when we talked about the number, was it 988? 988. Um, you didn't say this, but I wonder, so I'll put this in the form of a question. I assume if you know someone who's experiencing issues, you as a person of concern, can call 988. And the reason that's important though is because you you don't always know what to do. But the one thing you don't want to do is do the wrong thing. So if you call, they could call and say, you know, I got a I got a cousin who's doing such and such and such. And I don't think his mother would ever call, but well, what 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 could what could happen for him in a loving way? That would be very helpful for people to know that resource is out there. And the last comment I'm gonna say, I promise to be quiet, is that um through the school system, especially when children are young, um, there's a feeder process of sending things home, always sending things home, right? Well, it would be very helpful if some of the things we're talking about today in a very soft stroke can be sent home to parents about things to look out for, or if you have a problem with this, just call. So, you know, very, don't, don't demonize the child or scare them that thinking their child is something wrong with them, but simply we can help with that. We can make that better. Are they, are they having a problem studying? Give us a call. And maybe nine, maybe maybe 10% of them or 50% of them, it isn't because of any emotional issue, but you don't know. So you can help that small segment, then that would be helpful as well. So use the school uh, school feeder system as well as that concept of loving on them. I, uh, I, I respect to the remarks of her is that I know on our own and I know all those different programs. And it's, it, it, a lot of those therapists even though they're well-trained, their core um, drive to the profession is love. And I think we can't lose that. 
and we should try to spread that as much as we can. Thank you. I, I think one of the things I, when we talk about privacy and being in the black uh, community, getting help is sort of frowned upon. One of the resources that I've used is online and ThriveWorks is very good. And I do find people that look like us that are counselors and that you're, that you're comfortable with. So there's other resources besides just going into the doctor's office, the psychologist or psychiatrist's office. But when it comes to privacy, a company like ThriveWorks that's online is very valuable. A couple, Thank you. A couple of points. The Roanoke, the Roanoke the Free Clinic, Bradley Free Clinic, one of the things they've got out of the pandemic was a uh, telehealth service. There's some people with their mental, their mental health does not allow them to leave the house very often, does not allow them to be around other people. The only way they receive counseling is through telehealth. That That's great. And I just want to clarify one point. We changed the law after 2007, after Virginia Tech shooting. There are three criteria for which you can be that, that allow you to be committed for ECO, TDO type process. You're a danger to yourself, you're a danger to others, or you just can't take care of yourself. That's the third third leg that I think covers a whole lot of basis of what you're talking about. Thank you. So before we close, we're gonna have a pop quiz. What is the three digit number like 911 dedicated to mental health services? What is it? And we're gonna share this with all our family and friends. And instead of saying committed suicide, what are we gonna say? Very good. So we at least learned two things tonight. So thank everybody for being here tonight. And a special thanks to our panelists this evening. Can we give them a round of applause? And a really big thank you to all of you for coming here. This is um, you know, a really, really important topic. And we don't want the conversation to end here. And we have some fantastic news. We're going to do this again next year. For mental health awareness month, try to don't don't try to hide your excitement too much. But <laughs> but uh, this obviously is a conversation that we need to continue. So thank you all for being here. Um, our panelists will stay behind for a little while if y'all want to talk to them, take some pictures and all that stuff. But again, thank you so much. And on behalf of the Lynx Incorporated, the Charlottesville, Virginia chapter, we thank you again for joining us this evening. So have a good night.